up for it, find it, make it your own. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. Welcome to the show. Welcome listeners. Welcome thrifters, pickers, antiquers, and DIYers from all over the country. You have discovered the Get Thrifty Podcast brought to you by Arc Thrift Stores right here in colorful Colorado. Arc Thrift Stores is a Colorado thrift store chain. And if you're in Colorado or visiting us, please check out one of our 31 Front Range and Western Slope locations. You will not be disappointed. I am your host, Maggie Savick, and we are all about sharing everything that has to do with shopping secondhand. We've discovered that thrift customers are literally some of the most unique and gifted people out there. We're going to find all of them. And if you're a person who's part of our unique thrift culture, please contact us. We'd love to promote your businesses and your social channels and share your stories and advice with our listeners. You can find us on Instagram at our thrift stores. Send us a DM and let's chat. I am so excited. Today we are joined by Grace. Welcome, Grace. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Cannot wait to dive in, but a little about Grace before we get started. Grace Law, aka Mid Mod Boko, is a classical musician, researcher, and nonprofit exec, which we need to know all the things <laughs> about. Sure, I will share it. <laughs> Perfect. But has quickly been turning heads online with her sourcing of eclectic mid-century glass, something we love here on the podcast. As a lover of many things, thrifting and vintage repurposing feels like home. Grace serves up her mid-century finds on her Instagram page, where you can follow along with her latest obsession and all of her very exciting sales. We are so excited. Let's dive right in. Welcome, Grace. Thank you. Yeah, let's dive in. What what do you want to talk about? Let's go. Oh, I love this. I love this. Okay, so we always like to start with the DNA of our guests. So give us your backstory. How'd you get here? How'd you find thrift? Well, okay. As much as I would love to say, like a lot of people get to say that they grew up with this, their parents did it. Mine did not. I came from, you know, a middle class home where um, Italian Irish, where it's likes to be new and beautiful right now. I'm in my parents' house and it's like grand millennial took over here mixed with like <laughs> coastal, uh, white washed and blue things. Impressive. So <laughs> it's very different. You know, my introduction to thrifting wasn't really until I had left home and gone to school and, you know, school being college and the, degree programs that I've done. I'm still doing a doctorate degree right now. Ooh. So it's kind of been very simultaneous, but I would say my deep dive was really when I came to Colorado because the scene is crazy. Um, you know, growing up in Charleston, I lived in Mount Pleasant in Charleston County and the thrift scene wasn't really what you would consider the exciting thrifting that we all know to love. It was the thrifting where you go in and it feels like they just threw stuff in from the garbage in there and they put it on a rack oh, and it what smells a shame. funny. Yeah. I know. I think it's a little different now, but um, it wasn't that way growing up. And I think a lot of it ha just has to do with geography mm -hmm. and kind of the history of these areas because a lot of the things that we find in the thrift store, we know mid-century modern is really hot right now. Mm -hmm. And people are finding that in the thrift because that's that's the era that's coming to the thrift right now when people are downsizing or they're just getting rid of things that their family has had. That's the era that we're really searching for in the thrift. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really big in Colorado because of the location to the West Coast. And a lot of people love the mountains, so they come from other places. So there's a really great mix there. But in Charleston, it's Southern proper you know you're gonna find like old china and things like that oh so much um, china in the so south. much china i'm like <laughs> oh my gosh i could do without the china honestly i know some people come for me about that but i'm just like i break things easily which is hard to do and also have a business selling glass but you know i make it work um like china's just like i look at it and i feel like it breaks mm -hmm. so um you know, the scene is a lot different. At Southern Proper, you'll get a lot of, you know, grand millennial, but people here scoop that up. I'm not interested in it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just such a different scene in that way. Well, I love that you've kind of seen both sides of it. So what was your next step after North Carolina? Where did you go next? So um, 
from South Carolina because Charleston, South, South Carolina. South, sorry, sorry. Oh, that is a huge faux pas. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how do I want to say that? <laughs> um, so, well, I, you know, grew up here and for the most part um, of my life. And, you know, growing up, I've always been involved with music. I was a really big band kid, but from the age of say 12 or 13, I knew what I wanted to do was music and I wanted to do classical music, which oh, wow. is not everybody's cup of tea, but yeah. it was mine and I drank a lot of it. So um, from there, I went to New York and got my undergraduate degree at a conservatory. And um, that was a big shock going to somewhere like New York City sure. and that area. Um, just in the whole diversity of it, um, because it is a central hub. So from there, you know, I just became more aware of a lot of different things. I had been growing up in an area that had just very specific styles or specific mm -hmm. styles of living or people um, because it's a Southern thing. That's the best way to describe it. Sure, sure. You know, the Southern culture is very strong and Charleston is, one of the best known places for it. I mean, it, for the past several years, it's always been in the top five places to visit mm -hmm. um, because of that culture. But New York City is kind of where I really fell into my own with that. Um, it's also a, a great central music hub. And being a professional flutist, that's kind of where I started to discover a wow. lot of things. Like, what does eclectic mean? Like, mm -hmm what are these things you find? And you're like, what's this like dirty Brooklyn, you know, hole that is selling this weird stuff that is kind of cool that I have no idea what that is. Oh my gosh, what a shock. Yes. So that's kind of where I was. And I did an undergraduate degree, another graduate degree. And then I came out to Colorado for my master's. What and brought you to Colorado? What was the draw? The draw was- and That's a huge professor. change. Okay. Yeah. Good. So at the University of Colorado Boulder has one of the most epic flute players on the planet. Her wow. name is Christina Jennings. Um, if she listens to this, hello, you don't know that I do this too. <laughs> no one does. It's fine. Um, the secret's going to be out. Yay. I know. So when this comes out, everybody's going to know. My parents don't know that I do this. Wow. And my fun little secret to kind of hold on to. But um, so I came out here and then I just was, you know, in the midst of kind of grad school, that's really overwhelming at a really academic university. Mm -hmm. There was a pandemic and I was like, well, there's a lot of cool places to like go around here. So uh, why don't I do that? Yeah. <laughs> Just like very casual that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I went to the thrift stores and it was a great thing that just took my mind off of whatever rehearsals, the recording deadlines, the competitions, or, you know, the organizations and research that I've been doing, it was just like a Zen out thing. Yeah. And for me as a musician, who's obsessed with history and a researcher, I was just like, what is all of this? Yeah. I need to know. <laughs> so, you know, I became kind of obsessed with it because I, I love art, performing arts, visual arts. I've done a lot of visual arts. All of this glass is art. It is artists who do it. And their history is really interesting, um, you know, because they traded companies. They went international. They wow. did solo work. Yeah. You can see a lot of crossover in their designs. Um, and that's been something that I find very interesting because it's the same thing with instrument makers. They trade companies. The sound is different how they make an instrument is different. The glass is kind of similar, but it's visual, but I can really connect and grapple that information really quickly. So that was a big hook for me when I started kind of figuring this out. And I love just bright and shiny things. I play the flute. I mean, come on. It's a, it makes sense. <laughs> so, it's all connected. <laughs> it's all connected. The world is connected, you know. Do you have an idea for a great new podcast? You can bring your idea to life and start your podcast today with Libsyn.
Our podcast has been on Libsyn for almost two years, and we love it. Libsyn has everything you need to plan, launch, and grow your own podcast. Libsyn provides some of the best resources created by expert podcasters who will show you everything you need to know, like what equipment you should use, how to record great audio, how to get your show on Apple Podcasts and other popular platforms, and much, much more. Plus, as a friend of the Get Thrifty podcast, when you sign up with Libsyn, you get your first month of podcast hosting for free. There has never been a better time than right now for you to start podcasting. Visit Libsyn.com and use code FRIEND, F-R-I-E-N-D, that's Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, and use code FRIEND, F-R-I-E-N-D, to get started and create your podcast today. So. Well, educate us about glass because, you know, I'm finding, you know, when I first started doing this podcast, I discovered there's like underground VHS people, there's underground Pyrex people. But now I'm like learning this mid century modern glass situation is so loved. And it, there are several different eras of glass, several different places that they come from. Give us a little like short education tips about this kind of thing. So I would say personally, my favorite glasses are Scandinavian and Czech glass, which right now in terms of the collecting and selling community in America is not as much so appreciated. Um, There are tons of people that do, but what's really hot right now is the American glass companies. Um, And the number of American glass companies are a lot smaller than the amount that is in the European continent. which makes the information about it more accessible and easier to kind of figure out and identify, even though there's still a hard time sometimes distinguishing between certain companies and their times. Yeah. I would say, you know, some of the the biggest ones are Viking glass, Mm -hmm. Ellie Smith glass, uh, Blanco glass company, which is still in production today. Um, And then there's Fostoria and Fenton and Fenton, you know, even into the 2000s, they had like pieces on QVC where it's like, buy now. Wow. There's like 50 available, um, which is really cool when you think about it in kind of the mid century sense. And there's so many other ones like Rainbow and Bischoff, um, Pilgrim Glass, you know, but it's more so the big five of Viking, Ellie Smith, Blanco, Fostoria, and Fenton, I would say, are the big five US. And Black. you're finding these things. When you go out, you find the Met Thrift stores here in Colorado. I do. Wow. I have also a really exceptional little route that I love in Boulder that I find a lot Tell of us. Scandinavian yes. and Czech glass, which is epic. Um, I will say it is more difficult in thrift stores to get a hold of Ellie Smith or Fenton or Viking, especially because that is one of the more known things Mm -hmm. in the Denver Metro community and in Colorado and at a lot of other places around the country, people know what that is now, Mm -hmm. which is great. You get to share the history and the love, but it does make it harder to find. Sure. Um, So you can find them, but now that people know (laughs) that, you know, supply and demand, if you want to talk about that, that's a thing. It still is, um, even though it's just driven by interest in history, nostalgia, and collection, um, which for me is a big part of what I do. Um, you know, most of my audience and my customers, they are in a different age spectrum than myself because mm-hmm. these are the things they grew up with in their childhood. Yeah. Or these are things that remind them of their family. You know, I have to admit, like, this is not a time that I grew up in. This is not something that you know was in my generation but most of the music that i do perform is not in my generation either though <laughs> old soul yeah old i don't i know i'm an old soul <laughs> but i do love contemporary music and things like these glass companies there's certain artists that still produce they may wow. be in their 90s but they make their own pieces wow. like blanco for example they have an amazing collection of of artists and designers. And one thing about Blanco, since they still produce, you can go on their website and they have all of their glass catalogs. You can see and you can have an easier time identifying and they're very easy to follow. You know, you may have been mentioned that like the Viking glass book 
is like the glass book that is out of production. And if you find it online, it goes on auction starting for like $150. Wow. And even in their catalog, they have some typos on what they actually produce, like the name colors and things like that. But um, back on Blanco, because I can just go between these and then I'll just talk about it forever. So sometimes you'll have to cut me off and say, uh, we're good. It's a little <laughs> overloading. But like Wayne Husted, he's one of the most popular Blanco designers. Um, he was there for about a decade and he produced several designs a year. I think he in his tenure, it was about 600 designs he was responsible for wow. for Blanco as a company. He still is making glass. He's 91 now. And I was trolling his website the other day. The pieces that are his now, he does a glass and jazz series right now. They're about $1,200 a piece. Wow. But they are gorgeous. They are still have a lovely mid-century shape. Some of them have a modern twist. The names are, have me dying um, because he's got this like cordial set with a decanter that kind of rolls. So it's topsy-turvy. He calls it Rollatini. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> I know. I just, There's so many things that are beautiful about the about glass and the history. And one thing that I have to say about the community that I'm involved in is there's there's always not a literacy of what's accessible to learn. Wow. And that's something that is really um, important, I think, in this because it brings more appreciation to the business of, you know, selling and collecting. Um, when I do my sales, I try to give them as much information as I can while mm -hmm. keeping things moving. And that's what is really appreciated. And that's oftentimes what I find in some new customers to me. They find out this information and that makes them want something new. Absolutely. It's, it's not even necessarily what they grew up with, but it's something around the same time that expands what they're wanting to appreciate. Absolutely. You no, know, in, in my guts of hearts, that's a great phrase. Let's use that. <laughs> guts of hearts. You know, I'm, I'm someone who is an artist. I share my art. I appreciate art. Like this is like a core value for me mm -hmm. that that's kind of something that brings me to this because it's so beautiful and parallel to what I do in a different way um, that there's there's so much information. And one hill I will die upon is, is sharing the correct information as I get it. Mm -hmm. No one's perfect. Have I misidentified a piece before? Absolutely. Did sure. I sell it as a misidentified piece? No, I did not. <laughs> but <laughs> there's, well, there's so much to that. Well, let's talk about that. How did you get into the selling of this stuff? Because it, I mean, are you a collector first and then a reseller or do you consider yourself a reseller and just kind of dabbling in the collecting part of it? Um, I would take a different direction and say I was definitely a creeper first. <laughs> I was <Explain. laughs> a, a creeper first in watching and just looking and staring and collecting information. Mm -hmm. Um, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Oh, this is like, I feel like almost everybody's first introduction finding a mid-century piece in the glass store. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm crazy is anchor hawking. Um, this super popular glass. Um, they have this crinkle design. They have a lot of, you know, normal kitchen pieces and glassware that were kind of more mass produced. So you can find those easier. Mm -hmm. You're like, whoa, this amber colored glass has a crinkled pattern like paper why i like it it also looks like something that could be sold at anthropology today so then you're like okay oh, totally i'm into it mm -hmm. anthropology don't get me started they steal so much from <laughs> mid-century history totally <laughs> could go on forever uh but you know so i was a creeper first and then i started to collect a couple pieces mm -hmm. And how I started collecting was, you know, all right, I'm familiar with this company. Sometimes it's just the piece, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of collectors that all they collect is say Viking or all they collect is Ellie Smith, like mm -hmm. Ellie Smith, bittersweet swung vases. They're those orangey caramel yep. colored wacky looking things, right? Yeah. Bittersweet's yeah. really hot right now too, that that's their thing. For me, it's more about just the shape and the color of the piece, mm -hmm. you know? So my own collection is a little of this, little of that. Um, so as a creeper to kind of collector, and then when I wanted to kind of do some more of the reselling, 
my motivation was this is a great piece I wouldn't keep for myself, but I know other people would love gotcha. it. Okay. So kind of a, a necessity. You see it in a thrift store or an estate sale and you're like, this is great. It doesn't fit my style, but I know it's worth something and someone would love it. And you're saving it from a thrift store because as you know, it can get trashed. It can go to the wrong person. It could end up in recycling. I mean, all these things are, you know, how the thrift process works. So I love that you kind of gave it a new life. Why Instagram? Well, here's what I'll say is that Instagram was kind of where I saw people who are resellers have the most success in a concentrated period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, you could say maybe five or six years ago, most of the resellers lived on Instagram. Um, This is kind of a sidebar, but very relevant is like, if you have not seen the whole Lula Row documentary, I recommend that. <laughs> totally good. <laughs> because they all sold off of Facebook Live, if you remember yes. that. Yes. Oh, ago. they did. Yes. That was the platform. Yeah. Because it's the encourage of a live auction. It's the one-time item that is there. It is available during this period. You are getting to meet the person you're connecting with as your seller and your, your trusted sourcer for this item and also finding, oh, wow, it's an excitement period. It's kind of entertainment, but also a value to your collection or something new. You know, that was what Facebook was as to what Instagram is providing now in a different Mm -hmm. way, because, you know, there's reels, there's videos, there's stories. It's like a live action um, version to go with somebody doing whatever they're doing. Mm so to say, right? That Instagram provides the backstory, the front story, the side story. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, I'm having coffee this morning. Do you want to hear the birds? Yeah. Connection that you get to have with people to be encouraged to come through to know the items you have or you yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I choose Instagram and Instagram live is a great way to do auctions. Um, versus static sales like if you were doing something on ebay or etsy there's a terrible terrible time on the internet i'm sure people have mentioned this far of selling items that are not what they are or they don't know what they are Mm -hmm. and there's that very scary trusted process if i'm going to hand a stranger money on the internet sure that they will get it to me safely And it is as it says it is. And I love that, you know, you can sit there with your coffee and show a piece and really show all sides of it. And all. it's almost like you're there. So you definitely get that advantage. I love that. Okay. So that's really great advice for people that are kind of new to this. This is a great jumping off platform. Um, I, I mean, nothing bad to say about, you know, dipping your toe in with Instagram. How are you finding people? I mean, there's definitely this underground kind of connection. Do you pull from like all over the underground glass market? Is that kind of your your demo? Of finding people to connect with? Is yes. that the yep. yeah? So well, I'll be honest, you know, <laughs> I'll continue to call it my creeper phase. My creeper phase into this world uh was more so you know, seeing the people that were already engaged with this online and Mm -hmm. Instagram, there are other sellers that I have watched and admired and who are fantastic at what they do. And that's why they do it. And I like what they do. So I'll do something similar, but it's going to be my version. Gotcha. You know, that's, that's how you lift other sellers up in the community and celebrate yourself at the same time, Mm -hmm. because we all have the same goal um, to, to provide these excellent goods to people who love them, you know? So it was watching a lot of that, seeing those communities engaging with them when I started my process, you know, either sending messages or saying, hey, or following along. I mean, the biggest thing that brings more audiences to you is the content that you put out there. Mm -hmm. Um, Hashtags don't work the way we used to love them, but reels are- The algorithm has changed, yep. The algorithm has changed, but reels are still what brings in new people. That's great advice, okay. And and I have to come back to this because I was taking notes feverishly. Your boulder route, tell us your boulder route. People are gonna wanna know. If I skip over that, I'll get an email from someone going, you didn't ask about the boulder route. So what is 
you know, that part of town. So I, I take it you live in Boulder County then. I do. I live okay. smack dab right in the middle of Boulder. Oh, awesome. Okay. Tell us all your route for, for Boulder County and your favorites. Any oh, shout yeah, out to so, any other thrift stores too. Oh yeah. So, well, what's funny is that living in the middle of like Boulder, um, the closest arc is in Louisville. Uh-huh. Yep. So that's like the furthest store from my route. Which oh, is wow. Funny. But it was also the first store that I started going to. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not sure how that worked out logistically when it did, but it totally made sense at the time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so that was the start of my route, but now that's kind of the end of my route. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of great local shops in Boulder and they are nonprofits. I am a nonprofit person, so <laughs> I like I to it. go and support them. Yeah. Um, one, one store that, you know, I had worked at previously, um, and they're fantastic people who work there, Greenwood Thrift and Consignment. Um, they're a nonprofit for the Wildlife Center up in Hygiene, mm-hmm. and they have a consignment store up top where you will pay consignment prices, but you will get the goods too. Oh, wow. Um, and things will come through there. What's funny is that most of the things I would buy there are not what I resold, which is really funny. Um, but I love that store and I love those people. So go for the people and go for the goods. That's okay. one of my favorites. And there's a couple other local thrifts on that same area if you look at a map. Um, because I would say in my route, there's probably about four or five stores that are just in Boulder. Those are the only ones that you're going to find. And it depends on the time you go. Mm-hmm. Um, people have talked about on this podcast that they like to go in the early morning. That's when their carts are put out. Each store that I frequent has a different time when I know they put things out. Mm-hmm. So you could go to these stores, you could find nothing. You could go and find everything. Absolutely. And it just depends on the time. It's more about um, consistency than anything else is how you frequent when things are being put out. So my Boulder route is essentially all the stores in Boulder. Yeah. Just do the loop and then in in Louisville. I love it. Do you shop um, in Denver at all? So there's a couple antique stores that are towards Littleton Mm -hmm. and places like that, that I've gone to. Um, Actually, it's funny because, you know, this is a thrift powered by ARC. I think my most viral reel I have is from an ARC thrift store that I was in down towards Littleton. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And it was that. about <laughs> this mug wall. There were mugs, <laughs> stacked four mugs high on the shelves. Yes. There were mugs on the ground. And I was like, I'm going to dig through this chaos. <laughs> did you find so, me? <laughs> oh, I totally did. But it was funny because it's, you know, that's what I do love about thrift stores mm-hmm. is the digging process, which is a mix of excitement and anxiety at the same time. Cause I might be that crazy girl, crazy lady, whatever, there clinking through the mugs, just yeah. like, through them and trying not to drop anything. I'm like, <laughs> no one's here who would care. So I'm gonna keep doing it. I hope something's gonna break. <laughs> I know. So there's there's a couple places I go down there. So I go to the thrift stores there. And if you think about Littleton as an area or that right outside Denver metro area. Mm-hmm the suburbia concentration is almost like no other place. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. That when you're in an area, you're like, oh my gosh, there's going to be so much at the thrift store. Oh like, yeah. You're in an ocean of houses. <laughs> you you are. And you're like, what am I going to find? Like, that's what my brain says now. So I'm like, okay, it's fine. And you go and because they have so much inventory to move, you know, and that's one of the things that I like about ARC is they get so much inventory that the prices are really good. Um, and they're just ready to get it out. One oh, of yeah. my favorite things, I mean, I mostly deal in glass, but I do some furniture things as well oh, when okay. the weather's good, is I found this incredible hand carved, it's from the 1950s, like glider chair, but the upholstery on it was this beautiful orange and cream floral embroidered that looked like it had never been used. Oh, wow. That's and huge. It, it was like, it was $12, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I took it home and all I did was vacuum it and wet vac it, which took no time at all, let it dry. And then 
you know, sold that for several hundreds of dollars. Wow. And that was no, really no work on my end. But, you know, it's those concentrated areas, you know, ARC and other places that are in those areas are probably where you're going to find a lot of stuff if you just dig mm -hmm. and also for the massive amount of inventory. Absolutely. Yeah. Great advice because definitely our stores, we put them in neighborhoods. We want them to have a lot of people around that can donate to keep that place filled. I mean, that's where you find those hidden gems. So give us some advice. Like when you walk into a store, first of all, what's the first category you hit and how are you finding those unique one of a kind pieces? Okay. First category, it depends on the store. Cause I, then I know the layout. If it's a new store, then I'm like, Oh gosh. All right. I got to <laughs> be a little more careful about how I go through. Um, I will say, you know, because it is glass, it's mostly homewares and domestics that I'm going mm -hmm. into. Yep. We, Great advice. Most of the stores have that nice layout of homewares. Then it's usually furnitures and domestics put together. And that's usually where I need to be. Um, so that's where I go first. Um, the most populated areas of my search in these stores is the vase section and what you would consider like the little candle areas. You'd be surprised how many things that are not candles get put get in the put little candle area. <laughs> okay. That is great advice because it's so true. It's like a catch-all. It is a catcher. Um, some people say that, you know, go to the, you know, plastic storage containers because sometimes that's where enamelware is. I really don't find that. I have found some crazy stuff in the candle section, some of which obviously are candle holders. That is where they will put the bits and pieces of fairy lamps. Um, oh, yeah. There's sometimes I've literally seen in a local thrift store the top of a fairy lamp in the bowls area and they call it a funnel um that's one thing i love about thrifting and going to certain antique malls is they're like oh purple vase and it might be a purple vase that is a swung vase but it is a three-toe ellie smith that goes for you know anywhere from 80 to several hundreds of dollars amazing and that's why i love diving deep into these things because yeah. it's it's literally treasure hunting it is a lovely amount of dopamine that gets thrown into your head and you're like, this is fun. So. Yeah. And are you like, I mean, obviously you're more educated about glass, but is your advice like pick up, turn it over, look at it. What kind of markings should people be looking for? Give it us your secrets. Glass. It's, Ooh. it depends on the glass, honestly. Um, you know, Viking glass, for instance, it's, it's a very, very popular glass they have certain colors that they use. There's certain mm -hmm. designs that they use. If you can find a Viking with a sticker on it, that's incredible. That will tell you immediately that it's Viking glass. Um, whereas things like Ellie Smith, there's certain patterns like moon and star. Um, and it's actually called moon and star. It's not moon and stars. Mm -hmm. Um, I know there's things that I learned from the generation that grew up with this, who live on the Facebook groups. Wow. Um, like Don and Jed and his friends, they are major collectors and they'll post a picture every so often. I'm like, no one on Instagram knows about you because you use Facebook. Yeah. And oh yeah. The older generation. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And many, there has been many pieces that I had no idea what it was. I just knew the shape and the color was right. And it was really cool. So I said, yeah, I'll risk the like six bucks on this. Sure. Um, one particular story and it was the the spark of my obsession with like czech and bohemian glass is i found this really really great epic face it's i say epic epic is also a line in viking so i need to choose my language carefully um it was really cool we'll go with that um and in fluorescent light it is like this pale blue gray color but it had this great design and it was super heavy okay well, that has to be an indicator, right? Heaviness. Has, has, heaviness is a good thing. Old glass is heavy. It is chunky. Um, you're like, ooh, this was really well made because, mm -hmm. you know, most of them were hand molded. You know, it wasn't mass production. There is a golden indicator there. Um, and so, you know, I took that piece and the shape had looked good. You know, there's certain lines and shapes of mid-century glass that look very different from anything else so wow. if you have a curiosity about that that's also a really great indicator when i bought this piece 
I took it out of the store and I was in the sun and it was a purple pink color. Hmm. It was blue gray in the store. And I went to one of my Facebook groups and I said, Hey, I found this piece. It is blue gray in the store. It is purple. Now what's going on? Someone please help me. I don't know. And, um, just with that description, someone knew what it was. Yeah. And I took a picture of it when it was in the store. This is the thing, you know, just using Google, you will get crazy stuff with Google lens. Like, you know, you could take a picture of like a water bottle and it's like, okay, that's a red flower. Thank you. Um, you know, which doesn't work. (laughs) So, you know, I posted it on, um, I think it really was one of the generalist groups. There's generalist groups for glass and then specific groups for glass. And one of the best generalist groups is Heart of Glass. I posted it there. Wow. Heart of Glass, I know. Super cute. We love, we love glass, Heart of Glass. Yeah, I need to reach out to them. (laughs) That's a great idea. There's great people in a lot of these places. And, um, you know, I posted it and I was like, I don't know why it's doing that. Does anybody know what this is? So it's a type of glass called neodymium glass or alexandrite glass. And that means there is a percentage of neodymium, the element in it. So it reacts in different wow. lights. So now I collect neodymium glass. <laughs> That's incredible. And this particular piece was a neodymium piece made by Miloslav Klinger for ZBS glass, Lesny Brodsklo, which is a Czech glass company. Oh my gosh. Um, and this particular piece is made in the 60s when Milosov was a designer there. And um, I had bought a, a series of other things at this particular thrift store. And um, and this was not an ARC. ARC is always really great about ringing everything up. But they forgot to ring it up. I didn't realize it until I got home. Wow. So I ended up not paying for this piece. And I was really sad when I sold it. I wanted to keep it because it was ginormous. And, you know, sold that piece once I figured everything out about it for well over a hundred dollars. Oh, wow. And there's a lot of old glass that is UV reactive. So bring your little black light flashlight to the store um, because things like a neodymium piece, they glow like a corally red under light. The major um, elements in glass that glow are uranium, cadmium, and selenium. Wow. So depending on the glass color and the element that they also added into the glass will have a different color, usually a variation of shades of green or a variation of orange or corally reds. This is more than I've ever gotten to hear about glass. It's so fascinating. I I could talk about it it. all day, every day. (laughs) So let's just do a marathon glass talk. Right. And there's so many things. Bring your UV light. That is like the best thing that's ever been said on this podcast. (laughs) Who (laughs) knew? Bring your black light flashlight to the thrift store. You will be surprised. Wow. That is also a really helpful thing on finding out what old, what pieces are old glass, essentially. Um, Though, generally, if you find any type of crystal glass, like crystal glasses or goblets or whatever, Mm -hmm. that may not be old because it does have different elements in it, it will still have like a very faint green glow to it. Wow. There's things like... um, I'll take a note from Ellie Smith. So their line, Moon and Star, and their other lines, and Imperial Glass Company, which is a huge one, which I did not mention yet. And I don't know why. I'm just, my brain's going, wee. So um, Ellie Smith, let's say they're Moon and Star. They have a color that is ruby, and they have a color amberina. And they both can appear very red. Some amberina pieces can appear just like ruby. The, the same color. Amber, you know, usually has an orange and red variation color to it. But an amberina piece, when you click on your black light, will have different parts that glow orange because of the concentration of cadmium in that wow. glass. Oh my God, happens, that is so cool. I know. It happens with Viking pieces, Ellie Smith pieces, Imperial pieces. There's an Imperial sunset line, which you don't find much of that has amberina and little glow. Um, and a lot of, you know, European pieces, you know, there's so many Scandinavian glass companies and there's so many uh, Czech glass companies, just the whole European continent has what we have in American made glass in like a hundredfold. Wow. 
there's so many designers. It's, it's just mind boggling that it ends up at our thrift stores. That's, that's pretty awesome. So, I mean, I do have to ask you, and this is going to be two part. I don't always ask it in two parts, but you, the, the unicorn item that you have found and sold, like the most epic thing you've ever found in glass. And then the one piece you want to put out into the universe to hopefully find next. That's really difficult. I feel like I've had a couple really great finds. Um, I'll give you like maybe two different categories because they're really hard rivals. <laughs> so they're um, mid-century furniture we also know is very, very hot right now. Mm-hmm. And especially in walnut and teak, right? Oh yeah. So teak, it also has limited numbers of imports. It's illegal in some areas now because oh, wow. of you know, how much it was used and, you know, we want to conserve the things that we have. So finding teak furniture is really difficult. Um, That was my first big furniture score at a thrift store is this big giant teak dresser with all of the solid little brass knobs, just in beautiful condition. And I picked it up for maybe 20 bucks. Oh, wow. Um, And those things can be, you know, anywhere from 1500 to $2,000. Amazing. And you sold it. No, I kept it. <laughs> I needed a dresser and I loved it too much. There are certain things that you can't do that too. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. <laughs> there was one morning I walked in, it was a Friday morning to an ARC thrift store and somebody was putting out things and I found three different complete fairy lamps Oh, wow. Um, and fairies always set everybody into a flurry. Everybody loves fairy lamps. Yep. And, you know, I sold all of those. And that was one of the first bigger selling items that I had was those fairy lamps. Um, I recently just found a limited edition swung vase actually by the glass company Fenton. And when you think about Fenton swung vases, they have like these weird lines and like trumpet styles that are in the carnival glass which has that like glowy oil slick pattern Mm -hmm. to it and those aren't the swungs that are we love from like viking or ellie smith or some of the imports um but this is it is a carnival aqua drape swung base like traditional the top looks like little pearls oh wow and it's a three-footed thing just like ellie smith did and it was a limited run actually from the 80s that they only made a thousand of and i found one and i said okay i really like this i might sell it later but um another little glass fact is so ellie smith the glass company there was one production year that they made these swung bases in the color lilac the tall purple ones and online and in a live sale you can see them go from anywhere 800 to I've seen it go for over 2000 for one of those pieces and they made those for one year. So a question that I have for any of the people in the Facebook groups, if you know, and you're not sharing your knowledge with me, or I haven't asked you yet is, (laughs) do you know how many lilac bases they made in that? Wow. Cause that could be the unicorn item right there. (laughs) Well, it's a unicorn for a lot of people, Yeah, but this uh, Fenton vase, they only made a thousand from and it was for LeVay. So did they make more lilacs than this one piece? Because then I would, you know, I never might want to sell that. Um, I will say my, my taste in glass is a little different than a lot of people. Um, I love the history and I love finding these real and authentic pieces, but to anybody who's wanting to collect, you know, if you find a piece and it is an import or it's a made in China and you love that piece, I don't care if that makes you happy. That's great. Add that to your collection. It doesn't have to be one of these pieces. Um, You know, you're allowed to love the glass that you love and I will happily help you identify that if that's what you want. I do get inquiries about that. You know, some people be like, oh, this is really cool. And then they find it's a a reproduction made in China and then they decide they hate it. That's fine too, Mm -hmm. but somebody might love that just because they like it. I do have a lot of weird pieces, like not a lot, a couple of them, but one of my other greatest finds was at a local thrift. There's these vases from Arthur Percy in the sixties. They are um, by uh, Scandinavian glass and they're these very thin glass, 
very like blown glass is what they call them in these tall, tall tapers and how that survived the back room. Those vases Shocking. are very expensive too. Mm -hmm. anything like that. Um, so those are a couple of my favorite personal finds. I would say the, the biggest one that I had that I ended up not having to pay for was that new diamond piece that I wish mm -hmm. I collected a piece that I did recently find, um, actually is a Murano neodymium sculpture with the sticker on it. And those sculptures do go for about two to 3000 wow. and I still have it. Um, it is of a mouse, which is pretty it's fun. awesome. It's like eight pounds. It's oh heavy. It's this tall. Um, so I'm admiring that for now, but I will resell that at mm -hmm. some point. But yeah, there's so many great things to be found. <laughs> we'll well, talk about if, it all day. <laughs> well, what about the one item you want to find? What do you want to put out in the universe so that the thrift gods will provide? I mean, honestly, I've had only because of the exposure through social media. I've had a couple dreams that I walked into a thrift store and I did find like four or five lilac faces <laughs> at the same time. And just like sitting on the top shelf, nonchalant. Uh, but in one of those dreams, somebody else is like, oh, are you getting all of those? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to get all of these. And they're like, I just like the shape of it. I wanted to spray paint it. <gasps> no, no, <But> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to manifest that, but that's, I have had a couple dreams about that. Maybe it'll happen one day. You just put it out there. It'll definitely happen. <laughs> we never know. <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's get into some philosophy here, because I do want to know, I mean, you're obviously young, 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 which is fantastic. I love it when young people are into thrift and sharing the good word of thrift with all of their peers. What do you think's happened to the landscape in our country, in Colorado, all over the place, that younger people are discovering thrift? What do you think it's about? Um, I will say most people in my generation, theirs is for nostalgia for a time that they never lived. Um, most people in my age range, their kind of thrifting and reselling is mostly clothes. They're obsessed with that for themselves. Depop is a huge part of their culture. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I am young and I feel like that sometimes does put a different connotation on how that's reflected upon your business. Uh, but you know, I have in my life of professional executive working experience. I have five to seven years already and I mm -hmm. am finishing my fourth degree. So, you know, I love it's, that. it's something I, love it. that I take very seriously. Yeah. Um, and the organizations that I've worked in and been a director with and, you know, like the organization that I'm involved with now, you know, I am a director and I work with people who are in their fifties and sixties and like my board president right now, she's 91 and she's fabulous. Oh, I love it. And, you know, to do that in your mid twenties is fine, but you just need to, to work with that. And I feel like that's where my place has been a little different in the categories that I work in, um, because I do have those relationships and I do have the same appreciation. And I'll say the thrift scene in Colorado, you know, going in, um, is a lot of people who want to thrift and resell clothes. Mm -hmm. um, if they're trying to thrift and resell home goods, what they are shooting for is like 80s and 90s. Yeah. Which is so funny now because, you know, my audience is like, oh no, that's vintage. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they're hurt by that yeah they are hurt by that and you know what i'm hurt by that too because yeah. now it's a time that i have kind of lived in and remember and then i'm saying okay you people are born after 2000 and this is what you think is awesome i'm like <laughs> i remember when that was five dollars yeah. which is what some of my audience think about the pieces we have now mm -hmm. but five dollars then was not five dollars now you know <laughs> so I, I think that's what's very interesting is is the whole community of thrifting and reselling clothes, which is not my business. And some of them do furniture pieces, but mm -hmm. it's a lot different about what they're looking for. Yeah. Well, I love what you're doing. And I think that influencers like you are really, you know, helping to spread the good word of thrift. And it it blows my mind that you have this love and this knowledge of glass. Are you open to sharing that? I mean, I just feel like people are going to listen to this and they're going to have a million questions. Share all the places people can find you. So yes, I'm absolutely open and interested and more than happy to, if my schedule allows, share more about glass. 
I, in the middle of doctorates. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always been in school and worked full time simultaneously, which mm -hmm. comes with its own range of sacrifices. But you know, that's what I'm doing. So you know what? Love it. There you go. But to share that, I'm more than happy to. I don't believe there should be any sort of gatekeeping around the knowledge of these pieces that mm -hmm. we love that only helps us all find them better. Um, I love it. And, you know, the more you kind of strengthen that process between other resellers or the people in your community does help. Um, you know, yes, it is a business. Yes, you want people to shop with you, but there's going to be pieces that other people have that you don't, and they will still be happy that you led them there and will keep them returning. Um, there are lots of great glass books. Call me a mega nerd, but I did bring some home with me while I traveled. <laughs> um, so there's great books by um, Leslie Pena. She has a lot of great mid-century glass books. Um, one, which is a generalist book to kind of help you understand categories, Color Along the River. Um, Dean Six has a great mid-century modern glass in America. Um, what people really need to be buying is a lot of Scandinavian glass identification books. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, that Leslie Pena also did as well, Fire and Sea, and then um, what's the other one? Uh, Smoke and Ice. And then there's the great glass groups. Heart of Glass is a great place to start. They can also refer you to specialist groups. You can find me um, on Instagram at midmodboco, boco coming from Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. I was wondering what that stood for. I know. And it's funny when I've seen people, buku, boco, I was like, oh, darn. You know, some people don't get that. <laughs> I have a friend who's from Wisconsin and I just told him that I've been doing this. And he's like, midmodboco. And I was like, I can't <laughs> that. I picked up the accent so bad. <laughs> We love a Wisconsin accent. That's we, awesome. <laughs> I love him dearly. He lives in Utah now, but, um, you know, when this airs, then I'll have to, you know, let my musical world in on the fact that love this it. is something else that I do too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can find me there. You can always send me a message about identifying pieces. Great. I would say I do encourage the process of self exploration because it is very exciting you know, start with that Google lens, actually yeah. see what terrible things come up and mm -hmm. suss through the process. I find that discovery super interesting as also a researcher, you know, doing a lot of research with the clinical psychology department at the school. Oh, wow. Inter it's all connected. I love it. I know. I knew you were like, <laughs> this is separate. It's not separate at all because everything is based on what you like and what you value. Yeah. So. And it's part of overall who you are. I love it. Yes. Yes, well, we it is. We are so grateful for your time, as you know, because you are a listener of this podcast, which we're grateful for. Thank you for that, Grace. Um, we always like to end this podcast with a shout out to our girl, one Miss Dolly Parton. And as a musician, I know you appreciate her. So I'm dying to know, give us your shout out. What's your story? What's your Dolly Parton connection? So, I mean, here's what we all should know. And if you don't know this, I don't like to pass judgment, but everybody should know that Dolly is a true artist. Um, even if she says the same words, the intent and everything about it is different. And the biggest shout out that I have about um, Dolly Parton is so as a doctoral student, you have to have people on your committee, and you have to have five people on your committee. And there is an incredible composer her name is Annika Sokolovsky, and she's won numerous awards the past few years. She did her PhD dissertation on Dolly Parton. No. Yes. And she lives, <laughs> you know, not too far from probably where you're located. So you got to talk to her. Annika Sokolovsky, she did um, her dissertation and it is called Breaking the Bel Canto, Straight Tone False Dichotomy, What Composers Have to Learn About Dolly Parton. Oh, my God. So intellectual and incredible. And she's such a down to earth person. I'm plugging her because she's amazing. And she's on my committee. Give me A's. Um, <laughs> you know, I get my A's. Don't worry. Um, but that is my fun. Oh, my Dolly gosh. Parton fact. All right. I got to say it. You just moved into the top three of amazing Dolly Parton stories. I mean, that might take the cake. That's pretty epic. A whole doctoral dissertation from Princeton. Uh, wow. published by Princeton um, about Dolly Parton. That is academic, epic. academic, academic, 
PhD dissertation. That is just incredible. I mean, it, she really is everything of the sort that she would qualify in that regard, in that high esteem. I'm like totally blown away. I'm going to look her up. Annika, how do you say the last name again? I will spell it out for you. <laughs> so it's Annika, A-N-N-I-K-A. And her last name is Sokolovsky, S-O-C-O-L-O-F-S-K-Y. S-K-Y. Oh my god. When you read the abstract, the abstract is like, (laughs) you know, we in academia, uh, we have to write abstracts, which are about, you know, around 150 words about the premise. Yeah. And um, because it's a PhD, I was like, wow, this is so smart. (laughs) Oh, I know. Okay, hopefully I can get through it. Give me a chance. I'm gonna try and read it. That's amazing. Well, I'm sure you could also email her because she's willing to spread the love of Dolly. She loves Dolly. We all should too. Okay. I'm going to have to. Can I name drop you? Oh, yeah. You can name drop me. She's okay. on my committee. I'm probably uh, going to approach her for many other things that I need as well. Awesome. But she's incredible as a person, a composer, an intellectual, and, you know, golden ticket she loves and wrote about Dolly Parton. Oh, so that, that's, you know, she's the, great the A. Yeah. <laughs> And what a perfect tie in to our podcast. Grace, you've made my day. You're a complete delight. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I hope everybody appreciates my glass ranting. Um, I love to learn. So, you know, I'm going to spit it around. But also, you can trust that I will give you as much information about a piece if you're interested in it. And, you know, visit my page for what I see and find. Absolutely. And listeners, if you have questions, she's open to that advice. Grace, you're a delight. Thanks for joining us today. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. Uh, you can follow Grace um, on our on her channels, ask her all the questions. She's open to all the advice. She gave us seriously one of the best Dolly stories of all time. Epic. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. A reminder, please subscribe and leave us a five-star review about how funny, creative, and smart we are. And if you're a part of this unique thrift culture and you'd like to join this podcast, please send me an email, maggie at arcthrift.com or reach out via Instagram at arcthrift and now on TikTok at Arc Thrift Stores. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful week. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. This podcast was powered by Arc Thrift Stores and edited by Avocet Communications.